All right. You know, you know, sometimes in trying to pick out something that's funny, and I don't listen to Steve, by the way. But anyway, <laughs> and, and, and I knew he wasn't going to be here tonight. But uh, sometimes life is just too funny. You know, um, there was a, a guy that was traveling, and he was traveling actually through this state, and he went to a rest area. He was not familiar with Tennessee, and so consequently, when he stopped at the rest area after he entered the state, he he asked one of the attendants. He said, he said, never been in this good state, and he said, don't know much about it. He said, are there any maps? He said, I don't see any maps around. And one of the attendants said, yes. Yeah. Said, I'll go. They're in the back. I'll go get them. And while he was gone, the other attendant looked at him and he said, you know, he said, he said, we'd put those things out, but people just keep taking them. So, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Life is sometimes is funnier than a good story, isn't it? All right. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. The book of Hebrews is a, a wonderful book. Really, well, really in the last half of this chapter, the Hebrew writer begins to kind of wrap everything up. About the, the 19th verse or so, the Hebrew writer begins to just sort of put uh, everything into perspective, try to include everything. And he does a lot of that in the first part of this chapter. But the first part of this chapter is really very much connected with the ninth chapter and the seventh chapter. Remember, we talked about the seventh chapter and the, the uh, ninth chapter being about Christ, the the better uh, way, or the better sacrifice, excuse me, the better sacrifice. And we talked then about the eighth chapter was sort of a, uh, he kind of just threw something in the middle with regards to, to the covenant and which covenant to be under. And so he got back to the idea of Jesus as the better sacrifice. And he continues that in the tenth chapter, as we're going to study. And then about verse 19 or so, he begins to, to wrap it all up. Like I say, we don't know this for a fact because it wasn't until the 1700s that a man by the name of Barger said that the book of Hebrews was probably a a uh, sermon that was written down, inspired. We're not saying it wasn't inspired, but preached and then uh, put together in such a way. And when you start to homiletically looking at things or putting things together from the standpoint of a speech, you write them differently than you do, say, a letter, say, like Ephesians or Philippians or Colossians. And so uh, it's interesting when you look at this and you read it from that idea of, of uh, what's called homiletics or the idea of uh, preaching, that it does come off much like a sermon. And so whether it is, was or not, it doesn't matter. But it is in this 10th chapter that at least in the first, say, 16, 17, 18 verses, that the Hebrew writer continues this idea of Jesus is the better sacrifice. And he says, for the law, verse 1 of the 10th chapter, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect for then would they not have ceased to be offered for the worshipers once purified would have no more consciousness of sins but in those sacrifices there is a reminder of the sins every year for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Well, think about it. Let's break this down. He talks about the law was a shadow. Do you remember uh, taking pictures? And you remember the old negatives? You remember you would look up and hold them to the light, and you really couldn't make out anything from the negatives, but you could make out the image of the picture. Well, that's sort of the idea with regards to the shadow. It, it, it's that which sort of has a faint outline, but yet distinct. Sort of, you, you see the outline, but you can't really tell anything. So he says the law was sort of a, an outline of good things to come. 
the good things, of course. You could say Jesus, our inheritance, our hope, our faith, the redemption that's found in Christ. And he says, yet not the very image, not the exact representation. The word, the word here is the idea of the finished product. Not the finished product of things. Can never with these sacrifices, of course talking about the old law, the old way, which was offered year by year. And we've talked about that. We talked about it in the seventh chapter and we talked about it in the ninth chapter. But we talked about how the, the, there were sacrifices, there were, sac there were daily sacrifices, there were weekly sacrifices, there were annual sacrifices. And yet he's talking about, when he talks about this idea of year by year, he's probably making reference back to what we talked about, especially in the ninth chapter, the, the uh, Day of Atonement, Leviticus talks about the Day of Atonement and the scapegoat. And remember, we, we talked about the, the high priest going into the Holy of Holies and, and the, the goat that one was a scapegoat, which the sins were pronounced over and thus let out into the wilderness. Another a goat was, was sacrificed for the sins of the people. And, of course, everyone also bought, brought sacrifices as well. But he talks about this idea of they offered yearly, year by year, but those things did not make uh, an individual complete. They didn't make an individual perfect. They, were, they had to be offered year by year. And so I think all of us are, are good enough Bible students. We sort of know the conclusion here, so we'll not, I'm not ruining anything for you. But Jesus, being the perfect sacrifice... Is only going to have to be offered one time. Whereas those yearly sacrifices of the Old Testament and the Day of Atonement, he says they weren't perfect. For Notice what he says in verse 2, for there's that bridge word or one of them that we've talked about. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. In other words, you know, there, there was, if, if those were perfect, we'd just keep doing them. But he says, you know, they, they weren't perfect for, he says, then they would not have ceased to be offered. They, we would continue to do it. For the worshipers, once purified, once. Now he's talking about Christ here, once and for all. For if those under the old law, though, were once and for all purified or cleansed, there would be no more consciousness of sins. But he says, yet... Verse 3, in the old law, there were reminders of sins every year. When they came to the Day of Atonement, when they came to that time of year in which they made the pilgrimage, there were three special days in which especially a Jew was, was thought to, to, be, to have to be in Jerusalem and the Day of Atonement was one and, and they like I say they bring their sacrifices and so he says here he says this they had to do every year. The the point that the Hebrew writer is trying to make is is look what you did year by year and it never really did resolve anything. As we talked about last week, it just rolled really there was forgiveness from the standpoint of those folks were forgiven, but but it was really not until the cross that their forgiveness was enacted and thus their sins completely removed. So the Hebrew writer says here, these folks though had to do this yearly, year after year after year after year. You had to be in Jerusalem. You had to have the sacrifice. You had to have the Day of Atonement. And, and he says, he says this, was not, this was not a complete system. This was not the way that God wanted it to be. This was not the perfect way. This was the way God had set up. But it was not the perfect way, and it was not the end of all ends. For he said there was a consciousness of sin. Now, think about that. A consciousness of sin as opposed to a forgiveness of sins. Some folks even today have a difficult problem with that. I think I've alluded to this on a Sunday night lesson. 
And if I have, just smile and, and go, yeah, he's losing his mind. But uh, I'll tell you again, there's this lady that I had known for several years. And in my first located work, uh, she had moved. She and her husband had moved uh, to town where I was. And uh, she was a member of the church. And he was as well. And ever so often, she would come forward when the invitation was offered. The reason being, when she was young, and she, by this time she was well old enough to be my mother because her children were, one of her children was our age, she was in our youth group when we were uh, courting, dating. <laughs> and so anyway, but uh, before, before he was born, in her youth, she'd had a baby and she'd given it up for adoption. And she could not get over the guilt that she felt for that. No matter how much we talked to her, no matter no matter how, how much I talked to her and how much I showed her. And so every once in a while, uh, she would be at a low point and she'd come forward and we'd have prayer for her. And uh, she she would go about her way. Now, the best I could tell in talking to her, there was nothing necessarily that triggered those thoughts and those feelings, but just every once in a while, they would that guilt that she had, sadly, would be triggered. Now I know you can say, well, why did you pray for her? Because those what sins were involved in that were long since forgotten because she had come forward many times through the years. I understand that. I understand that uh, as the old saying goes, God probably didn't know what we were talking about to a degree, but at the same time too. It helped her. And so we're in the business of helping people. And so we did that. The elders understood because I talked after I had talked to her, I had the, she gave me allowance to talk to the elders. I talked to them and told them at least what they needed to know. I didn't tell them everything, but I told them what they needed to know. And so we handled it that way. Now you think about every sin in your life. And every sin, if you will, from year to year to year to year. And the reminder that had to be there. It's not to say that as Christians, we forget about the sin that we've committed. But with the forgiveness of God, it's gone. Once we have repented and we have taken the necessary steps, God forgives. It's gone. But it all gets back to the fact that Christ died on the cross for us. But under the old law, it was still renewed every day. For it was not possible, look at verse 4, it was not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. So what could they do? What did they do? Blood of Christ, right? In comes the blood of Christ. And so... The Hebrew writer says animal sacrifices just, they're not enough. They're not enough. But Christ is. Verse 5, anything anybody wants to say or add? I didn't ask any questions there. Okay, verse 5. Therefore, that's one of our bridge words. He's connecting the paragraph that he just finished with what he's talking about next. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, and he gives us a quote. Quote from Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. I just want to stop right there because I'm going to give you something that was fascinating to me as I was studying this. This is, as we said, this is a a quote out of Psalm 40. It reminds us uh, of, uh, do you remember what it reminds you? Does it remind you of anything else? Not in Psalm. First Samuel 15. David. Look in Psalm, uh, First Samuel 15, 22. You'll get the uh, same feeling as you will from this text. But I want you to look at um, that second line there. But a body you have prepared for me. What do some other versions have? What do we got tonight? Other versions. This is the New King James. Any versions have anything different? 
Well, let me tell you what the Hebrew says, literally. And, that, and you go back to Psalms. Literally, it says, ears hast thou digged for me. And you look at that and you think, what does that mean? Ears hast thou digged for me. The phraseology is the idea that God has given man ears to hear his word and obey what he said. That's the, the, the idea of the Hebrew idiom that's used here. A body you've prepared for me. You've given me ears to hear what you have to say. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. But then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of this book, for it is written of me to do your will, O God. Does sit, verse 6 seem strange? Put yourself for a minute in, old, in an Old Testament setting. You're, you're living in the day of, let's just say, Jeremiah, the prophet. You're living in that day. And you think about, uh, you read, say, Psalm 40. Burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin, you had no pleasure. But what would you think? <laughs> Why are we doing it? What's the purpose of it? And then you also would ask this question. If I'm trying to please God and God really has no pleasure in it, then not only why am I doing it, but what what is it accomplishing? But in as much as what is it accomplishing, why did he tell me to do it? Look what he says. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of this book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Well, wait a minute. I thought, and we're still we're still in this mindset of the Old Testament, okay? Old Testament times. Wait a minute. I thought you told me to do this. I thought you told me to to give sacrifices, to offer sacrifices. I don't get it. I don't get it. But look what it says. Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. To do your will, O God. Verse 7 seems to be what would have been in, in the psalmist's day predictive. Behold, I come. Who could that be talking about? Jesus. Behold, I come. And so when you think about the, the Old Testament, you think about all the prophecies, there's over, and, and it, it really depends on how and what you count. But it has been said that there, are, there were over 600 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. But just think about some simple ones. It talked about his birth, and he'd be born of a virgin. It talked about uh, his life. It talked about how that his life w would, would be conducted, that that uh, he would, would be a man that would be humble. It talked about his death. It talked about his burial. It talked about his resurrection. It predicted these things. It predicted all of these things. And so he says, now I came, but I came in the volume of the book that is written of me, the predictions that were made of me, but I came to do your will. That's the most fascinating thing, or one of the most fascinating things about Jesus, isn't it? God. God in the flesh. And yet, he obeyed. Did he have to? Well, he did if he was going to fulfill the redemptive will of God, right? The Father. If he was going to fulfill the redemptive will of God the Father, he had to die because that's that was from the very beginning almost. And he did that. And so here's what's going on. The Hebrew writer is saying, 
Christ came and he's going to fulfill the sacrifice and for us in the way that the old sacrifices or the sacrifices under the old law could not fulfill. Because think about what he says. Now look at verses 8 through 10. Previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I've come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. But they will, will <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. He said, sacrifice offering for sins you didn't desire. If God didn't desire the office or the offering of sacrifice, what did he what did he really desire? That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Exactly right. Exactly right. Very true. Very true. Very true. Anybody else? Let's think about it and then let's draw an analogy to today. To do something empty headedly and empty heartedly. You're going to question me on grammar, I understand. So we'll just be Lydell Sims and make up that word. <laughs> Not sure that's a word, but we're going to use it accommodatively uh, tonight. Without meaning, but simply put, going through the ritual of the time had no meaning. In other words, these folks could bring a sacrifice. And when you stop and think about it, they brought the sacrifice, but who really did all the, the work? Priests did. Yeah, yeah. And so consequently, okay, yeah, it's, Dave Tom, it's, it's coming, Dave Tom, I got to go to Jerusalem. Come on, sacrifice. Priest, here it is. See you later. Empty-headedly, empty-heartedly. Meant nothing. Now, before we move further with that thought, let's take the application of today. We've got to be very careful that we don't do the same thing. I think the pandemic may have helped us more in this than we realize. But getting up on Sunday morning and going to church and then you know, oh, it's 6 o'clock, it's Sunday night, we're supposed to be at church, or it's 5.30, we would get there, you know. Oh, it's, you know, tonight's Wednesday night, well, tonight's church night, okay. But we come, and we think nothing about it. Because we've always done it. We've always, you know, we, we've always been to church on Sunday morning, we've always been to church on Sunday night, we've always been to church on Wednesday night. And we just come. And we come with the idea, well, you know, the Lord ought to be pleased with the fact that I went to worship. I went to church, as we call it. You know, there, there's that checkbox George was talking about. Check that off, Lord. I was there. It becomes something that really means nothing. Now, I think personally, I think the pandemic, the quarantine and not being able to meet together probably helped us all to understand the importance of being together, fellowship. And that's one of the things we're going to see when we get to the chapter 25, 26. When we get, a lot of folks refer to it as, as the Lord's letter patch. 
it's there. But it, it's a danger that we have to be careful of. That we come to worship God. That it means something to us. That, that when we come to worship, we come to worship. And let it come from the heart. That translates into a daily life. That, well, I'm not just acting this way because I have to, but I'm acting this way because this is the way that pleases the Lord. What Jim just said. This is what the Lord wants. And so that's the way we live our life. So in many ways, while the Hebrew writer is just addressing the idea of, look, Jesus is the better sacrifice, he's also giving us a principle to think about of letting our Christianity be real. Don't let it be fake. And you might say, well, I'm not fake. A lot of us pretend when we come. A lot of us. Sad story. Happened not at this congregation, but another that I was serving. And very faithful man and woman raised their children uh, to go into church and every activity. They did a lot of things for the youth. They provided transportation for the youth. They had their home. So they did a lot of things for the youth. Their kids grew up, had kids. They, you know, they watch their children drift from the church, sadly. And as it happened then, later on, in, he died, and she was there at church every time by herself. And especially one of her children started coming to church on Sunday mornings to be with her. And knowing, as unfortunately the elders and I knew his actions, we were very fearful that once she passed away, he'd quit coming to church. Sure enough, she died. He quit coming to church. I will let God judge him. I will not judge him. But I will say on a surface and from talking to him that his faith was tied to his mother and not the Lord. We need to be careful that our faith is tied to the Lord. And I see that in these verses. You may not, but I do. So I make that application. I get off that soapbox now and we'll move on to something else. (laughs) Anything you might like to say. Well, look at look at verse 9. He said, Behold, I've come to do your will, O God. I, I came, God, to do what you told me to do. And so he did that, of course, in that he gave himself as a sacrifice. And so he takes away the first, that he may establish the second. Now, if you stop and, and think about this, that little phraseology really carries you back to the eighth chapter, where he talked about how that, and the first covenant and the sac- second covenant, and the first covenant was taken away and the second covenant was installed. And so this phraseology carries you really back to the eighth chapter. He says, I came away, I came to take away the first to esta- so that the second may be established. And so the Hebrew writer is trying to impress upon the reader of today even that we are bound by a second or new covenant, which we have, which we call the New Testament. And he says, by that will, we have been sanctified. By that will, we've been, the idea of sanctified is the idea of set apart through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. We've been set apart because of the offering of Christ. What a, what a tremendous, tremendous blessing that is. Sanctified, set apart from the world, set apart from sin, set apart from, from the ways of the world and from Sin itself, which leads, of course, to the idea of being purified and and redeemed and justified, that it's all found in this whole chapter. But notice what he says, that this was done through the offering of Jesus 
once and for all. It was done through the offering of Jesus once and for all time. We don't have to do it anymore. When I turned 18, uh, my my parents had instilled with them in me my whole life that I was going to college, and I did. But when I turned 18, they had just pretty much, maybe the year before or two years before, but they had said that, you know, if you want to get grants and loans in order to go to school or in order to go to college, you had to uh, sign up for selective services. Now, that didn't mean they were going to draft you or that they were enacting the draft, but you had to sign up for selective services. And so I did that. I was told that that's the only time I'd have to sign up for it. I believed them because I haven't signed up for it since. <laughs> and I don't plan on it now. That ship has gone. But the reality of it is, is that's what he's saying. He said, Jesus did this once. He did it, but he did it once. And it's good from, from then on. You don't have to do it again. Anything else? Well, the score is two to nothing. No, I don't know. I don't know. Well, let's go on. Verses 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. At least maybe we can get through those. Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Every priest, all the priests. It's interesting because the idea of every, if you notice the word every there, at least to me signifies the idea of different ones, different times, but there were several of them, many of them. And so every priest stands ministering daily, offering sacrifices. And have you ever thought about, I know uh, ancient writings talked about uh, some the priest glorying and and being knee deep in blood from all the sacrifices. But have you ever thought about all the sacrifice, all the blood that was, say, on the Day of Atonement, all the Jews and all the blood that the, the animals sacrificed? Just, I, you know, I've thought about that. And and the one thing I've thought about was that's probably when I wouldn't have been a priest under the old law. That's the, because you do know after a day or so that stinks big time. And trying to get rid of all that, clean all that up, which they evidently did. But the Hebrew writer is getting into this idea of, well, just, you know, they just kept doing it. Same priest. Of course, there was a lot of them, but same priest, just daily. Just offering one animal right after the other, right after the other. Same place, same animal, same time, same way. But he said, Hebrew writer says, it didn't take away the sins. But this man, verse 12, talking about Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, he's finished. He offered it. He's done. No more. He sat down on the right hand of God. A place of honor. A place of dignity. To sit on the right hand of God. The right hand was considered, and if you're left-handed, i not slighting you, this is not from Paul Darty, but the right hand was always considered in ancient times a place of honor. And so he says, when, when Christ sat down at the right hand of God, he was sitting down in a place of dignity, a place of honor. Of course, he sat, if you will, upon the throne, sitting with, with God Almighty. And from that time, verse 13, waiting till his enemies are made his footstools. He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting on the enemies to be made footstool for by one offering. Now think about this, and here's the contrast. Look in verse 11, every, daily, repeatedly. Now verse 14, once, one offering. He is perfected forever. Those who are being Sanctified, those who are being set apart from the world. So there's a, a present tense then to this action. These folks did this. These folks acted in this way, and they did it daily. They did it repeatedly. Christ once for all, but in that once for all, still is sanctifying even people today. 
Those people did it then, and that's when it was it's done. It's over with for them, but it was done in that day. Jesus did it once, and it is continually doing, continually cleansing. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us after he had said before, and this kind of carries you back to Jeremiah 31. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I'll put laws into their hearts and in their minds. I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. This is the covenant. This is the agreement. Remember we talked about the word covenant last week. It just simply means an agreement. This is the agreement that I'll make with them after those days. I'm going to put my law into their hearts. What's the contrast? Where was the law said to be under the old law? Stone. Tablets of stone. The law was said to be on tablets of stone. Under the new law, it is to be written to their hearts. It became thus something from a, a standpoint of just ceremony to actually being the man, woman of God that lives the life that they're supposed to. And so he says, I've written, I've put the law into their hearts and into their minds. And he says, I'll write them there. But then he goes on and he adds this in verse 17. Their sins and their lawless deeds I'll remember no more. That's the forgiveness of God, isn't it? God forgives, right? When God forgives, God lets go of it. It's gone. Don't have to worry about it anymore. And he says, I'll remember their sin no more. Now, where there is remission, the word remission is the idea of what? Payback? Removal? Removal of the debt? Getting it gone, if you will? Where there is remission of these, there's no longer an offering for sin. You don't have to offer. You don't have to continually offer. As we've said throughout this whole book, the Hebrew writer has been saying, this way is better, this way, the new covenant, the new law, the new testament is better, 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 better. And he's been saying, you know, we had a better messenger, better apostle, better priest, better covenant, better sacrifice. And he says, here's the better sacrifice. It's Jesus. We don't, have to, we don't have to worry about all these lambs and all these bulls and all, all these rules and laws of the old law. Done away with. But Christ is better because in Christ we have the remission of sins. Anything else? Good point. Excellent point. Very true. Yes. Yes. Christ was the perfect sacrifice without blemish. Anything else? Well, let me encourage you to, we'll stop right there. Let me encourage you to be with us Sunday. Sunday morning's lesson is entitled The Naked Preacher. The preacher, your preacher will not be naked. Thank goodness. Thank you. Yes. You notice my wife laughed. <laughs> but uh, needless to say, I hope you'll be here for that one. It, uh, it, in some ways, you'll see how it does. It ties in with the idea of freedom, and with Sunday being the fourth. And I'm sure some of you will be out. And so, if you are, we hope that you have safe journeys. And if you're not, we hope that you'll be with us. We will start with verse 19. Verse 19 is really, like I say, this is, this is the finishing touches. And this is, in many ways, as the Hebrew writer will talk about, we have a, a better way. And it's a way of, of faith, a way of obedience, a way of following God. And so he'll, he's beginning to kind of wrap up. This reminds me, of Brother G.P. Holt. I don't know. Does anybody know who Brother G.P. Holt is? Okay. Um, Brother G.P. Holt oh, was a black preacher, okay? Wonderful gospel preacher. Brother Holt thought every sermon ought to last 
two to three hours. And and I was sitting one time listening to Brother Holt preach the gospel and doing a marvelous job. And he said, in conclusion, and a brother that had been amening him the whole time, and there were several folks amening Brother Holt, but the brother that was sitting to the to the left of the pulpit, to my right, because I was sitting right about somewhere like here, and uh, when Brother Holt said, in conclusion, this brother said, number one, well, Brother Holt, just died laughing. He said he knows something. And somebody said, well, what's that? And he said, I have several conclusions in my sermon. <laughs> and so then he said, so somebody said, well, what does that mean? He says, it doesn't mean a thing. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a tremendous gospel preacher and uh, well loved, well thought of. And so sometimes when I say in conclusion, it doesn't mean a thing. We'll pray. Y'all have a great week. We love y'all.